Yes. From the 19th meeting of the Society, we turn to the 2344th meeting and tonight's lecture on Brave Genius, A Scientist's Journey from the French Resistance to the Nobel Prize. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Sean Carroll. Sean is Wilson Professor of Molecular Biology and Genetics at the University of Wisconsin and Vice President for Science Education at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. His research is centered on the genes that control animal body patterns and play major roles in the evolution of animal diversity. His work has revealed that changes in how these genes are regulated rather than in the genes themselves are responsible for much of the physical diversity in the animal kingdom. He is an author of more than 125 publications in science. He has also written several excellent books on evolution for wider audiences, including Remarkable Creatures, The Making of the Fittest, and Endless Forms Most Beautiful, as well as a biographical book, Brave Genius, that is related to the subject of tonight's lectures. Sean authored the Remarkable Creatures column that appeared regularly in the New York Times for several years. He has served as scientific and executive producer on over a dozen science films, including Nova's two-hour celebration of the 150th anniversary of the publication of On the Origin of Species, which was based on two of his books. Finally, it's worth noting that Sean appears frequently on radio and television to discuss science and is a tireless worker to bring science to the public, especially the young. Sean earned his BS from Washington University in St. Louis and his PhD from Tufts University. Please hold questions to the end of his lecture and welcome me in joining and welcoming Sean to the podium. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. How are we doing for sound in the back? We good? All right, here we go. Well, Friday night, March Madness. You had choices, so this better be decent, huh? Well, thank you for, to the Society for having me. Thanks to all of you for coming out on a Friday night for this talk. Um, what's going to happen here tonight? Well, I'm a big believer in the power of stories, and I think Rudyard Kipling got it right when he said, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And I think that's not only true of history, but that's true of science, and it's certainly true of the history of science. So tonight, we're going to put this to the test. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about someone who had an enormous influence, both inside and outside of science. You might have heard about him. His name is Jacques Monod. He won the 1965 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. He had quite an illustrious career. He was a co-founder of molecular biology, that field of really understanding life at the molecular level. He shared the Nobel Prize for working out the first principles of gene regulation with a colleague named Francois Jacob, who I'll tell you about a little bit in a second, or in a little while, actually. Uh, he worked out a principle uh, that he called allosteric, which is uh, the regulation of protein activity. It's a fundamental way that life is regulated at the molecular level. And later uh, in his career, he served as what, the eighth director of the Pasteur Institute. So it's a, it's a really um, fantastic career, but there was much more to Jacques Monod's life. And that's what I dug into in the book Brave Genius, and that's really what the story that I'm here to tell you about tonight. Um, I think Monod's life is sort of summed up in this pearl from the writer Henry Van Dyke, who said that genius is talent set on fire by courage. And really one of the things I want to unpack for you tonight is uh, those um, ingredients of courage that uh, were necessary for Minot to really flower. But Minot also thought that there was a very important dimension to science beyond understanding the mechanisms of life, beyond, for example, the development of technology. He said he thought that the most important results of science had been to change the relationship of man to the universe or how we see ourselves in the universe. And there are really two great ideas out of biology that have fundamentally changed the way we see ourselves. And the first, really from the voyages and insights of Darwin and Wallace, was the idea that species are of natural origin, not divine. And the second, and not thought about that much, is really the ubiquitous role of chance 
in the course of the history of life. And it's that latter idea that, is, that it was uh, really brought forth by this field of molecular biology in which Minot played such a crucial role. I'm going to tell you more about that um, tonight. Um, it was Minot who, in fact, drove this idea of the importance of chance home in the history of life in a book he wrote called Chance and Necessity. Uh, perhaps it's not so surprising that it was a Frenchman that uh, brought the philosophical implications of molecular biology to a, to a broader audience. But, but why Minot? And there's, there's a really sort of a story to that. This, this book really could have been the subject of his autobiography because chance played a huge role in his life. Um, his friend, Albert Camus, once said that there's an element of chance to the root of genius. This is absolutely true for Minot. The chance is that he would even have lived to have a scientific career let alone ascend to the heights of Stockholm, were very slim. So what I want to do in my talk tonight is uh, reveal for you some of those ingredients of chance that spurred Minot's genius and that led really important people into his life. And then the last little bit of the talk, talk about his ideas about the role of chance in life and some of the things we've learned since Minot's time. So my tale tonight is going to begin in the 1930s with Minot in, in his 20s. And really, if you met Jacques Minot uh, as a younger man in his 20s, there was really no sign of the greatness that was to come. Uh, he was a really bright guy. He was an ambitious guy. He was an energetic guy. But he really struggled after his undergraduate degree in finding direction in his life. So he was interested in lots of things. Um, he was a sailor. Uh, he grew up in Caen in the south of France. He loved the ocean. So in 1934, when he was offered a chance to go on a natural history voyage to Greenland, with the most illustrious uh, French explorer, uh, Charcot. He jumped at the opportunity. Here he is actually having a chat with an Inuit um, that came aboard when they reached Greenland. Um, but Minot didn't go into marine biology. Uh, in fact, two years later, in 1936, he was offered the opportunity to sail again on the, the same vessel. And at the very last minute, he, he changed his mind and decided not to go. And uh, turns out the ship was caught in a hurricane off Iceland and sank with the loss of all but one aboard, his, his first encounter with chance. Instead of going on that, that cruise, he actually came to the United States and he studied briefly with this man, T.H. Morgan, uh, considered one of the founders of the field of uh, modern genetics. It was Morgan's group that really worked out the chromosomal basis of heredity, the idea that genes were on chromosomes. Minot got almost nothing out of his time in Morgan's lab because he was distracted by other things in Southern California. Um, he, was, he was a young man. Uh, he was interested in lots of things. He, he liked uh, rock climbing, things like this. Um, uh, he fell in love once or twice in the year or two that he was in Southern California. But also, he was quite a decent musician. And uh, both in France and in Southern California, he wound up directing uh, various choral groups. Uh, Bach was his favorite. Here he is directing a group here at the center. Um, and really, for the longest time, he's really spent his 20s sort of agonizing between a choice between science and music. So that really when he finally decided that it was going to be a life in science, he was almost 30 years old and had still not found a specific problem to study. And like most Frenchmen, he didn't see the future too clearly. In the summer of 1939, uh, the winds of war were blowing across Europe once again, and Minot, uh, on uh, August 31st, I think, he, he wrote this letter to his father. I'll just translate for you a little excerpt. He says, there will be no war. Hitler is much smarter than Wilhelm II, and he knows what it would cost him. I only regret that the English are too polite with him. They should have not bothered writing him long letters. They should have told him to piss off without any further explanation. <laughs> and the very next day, Germany invades Poland. Now, this is really important for France and Britain because both France and Britain have treaties with Poland to come to her aid. So both France and Britain declare war on Germany, but as most people would know, um, not much happened. No one really had the stomach for going to war with Germany yet again, just 20 years after World War I. So really, Poland was sacrificed. And what uh, emerged from those times in the fall of 19. 39 was this strange situation where France mobilized her, her army, Britain mobilized her army, um, but it didn't erupt into a shooting war. And that there was this tension along the, the, the French-German border, but really other than an occasional shot or minor, minor skirmish, really nothing much happened. 
And week after week, month after month, this went on. Monod really wasn't sure what to do. He was in a lab at the Sorbonne in Paris, um, working on his doctorate. But he was really concerned. Now, he was turning 30 in the winter of 1940. Um, he was newly married. Actually, uh, his, um, he was a, a new father of, of twins. And he was concerned that if war did really break out, since he had already served his, military, his, his compulsory military service long earlier, that he was going to get some rear guard administrative position. And he, was, he thought that would be pretty horrible. So he thought, well, I, I want to use some of my scientific interests just in case war breaks out. And he decided that he would join the communications engineers. Now, his reason for doing that was twofold. One is he would, in fact, learn electronics and communications, Morse code, all that sort of thing. But the second reason was there was only one regiment. And it was stationed in Versailles, just outside Paris, where his family lived. So he figured, well, if I learn this, at least I'll be stationed close to my family. So he decided to put the laboratory on ice and go train in the south of France with the communications engineers. And in May of 1940, he, he came back to Paris, to Versailles. And three days after he came back to his base, Germany invaded France and Belgium and Luxembourg and Holland. And things, as you know, went very badly for France very, very quickly. Minot never made it off his base. Um, within six days, the German army had broken through the French front lines, was making a dash pretty much for Paris. Um, the French army was collapsing very quickly. So um, Minot had to write to his wife to, to decide what were they going to do. And he was trying to encourage her, his wife's uh, name is Odette, um, to leave the country with the children, to race for the French coast, get on a boat, get to England. They had some very distant relatives living in England. And he said to her, I know that when the time comes, you will do everything so that our children live free. As far as I'm concerned, I will never believe in the total and final victory of those people, even if it would appear to be as total and final as possible. So he's thinking, just get out of the country and I'll, I'll, I'll find you. But there really was no time. Odette got as far as the coast, but couldn't get on a boat. And within a few weeks, France had capitulated and, and had surrendered. Later that summer, they were reunited, the family, Jacques and Odette and their twin sons, uh, in their apartment in Paris. And the city they came back to in late summer of 1940 was, of course, dramatically different. Um, most of the restaurants and hotels and government buildings had been requisitioned um, by the occupying forces. Uh, the German army was marching daily down the Champs-Élysées, singing. And while uh, the Germans got all the goods that were on the shelves and all the stores, uh, the Parisians lined up in long lines for bread and basic staples, of which there was I insufficient calories, in fact, to just even maintain body weight through the winter of 1940. So that was bad enough, but some more uh, ominous signs started to appear in the subsequent weeks and months. Um, especially after this event, in late October of 1940, the uh, new, newly installed head of France, uh, Marshal Pétain, met with Hitler in a little French town called Montoir in late October. And after that secret meeting, he announced to the country that he was embarking, embarking on a path of collaboration. So what did he mean by a path of collaboration? Well, in the, in the Minot household, that path was pretty clear very quickly. So Jacques was of a Protestant background, but Odette was Jewish. In fact, she was the granddaughter of a, of a, of a great rabbi of, of Paris. And um, one of the first requirements was that he had to re register himself as the spouse of a Jewish person. And this is that, that actual registration, which he made just a few days later uh, in October of 1940. And um, what were enacted at the time were a series of anti-Jewish laws controlling the civil liberties of, of Jews in Paris and across the country. And this was really shocking for several reasons. First of all, these were measures being instituted by the, at least the French government. It, it was um, certainly under the influence of the Germans. But this was really different for France because France, up to that time, it had one of the most liberal immigration policies of all European countries. Many people leaving Austria, leaving Hungary, leaving Poland, made their way to France. So there was a big population of foreign-born Jews in France. And now these tremendously restrictive measures were coming into um, effect. And the combination of these shocking laws and the collapse of the country, which no one expected, the, the collapse of the army in five or six weeks when it was a gigantic army that had certainly prevailed in World War I, 
this was a lot for Jacques and his friends to absorb. And as they talked with one another, they started thinking, well, you know, what, what can they do? They're, they're, you know, there's no real sign that the situation is going to change at all. In fact, it might be getting much worse. Their only hope and their only contact with the world outside France, because the media is completely controlled by the Germans, is the BBC. That summer, the BBC starts broadcasting in French several times a day, uh, French programs on several bands so that people with radios can pick them up no matter what kind of jamming the Germans are trying to do. And is that, if you happen to be lucky enough to catch a broadcast or have a radio, you can know a little bit about what the BBC is saying. But the general idea was to try to share that information about what was going on in the outside world. And so one of Jacques' friends, a lawyer named Leon Maurice Nordman, a fellow music lover, um, got together with uh, a few academics from uh, an institution in Paris called the Musée de l'Homme, the Anthropology Museum. Uh, here's a few of those people. And they decided that they would just put together a newsletter, a simple one-page newsletter where they would collect information about what was going on either in France or outside the country and share it with like-minded folks. Um, so this in hit to history is known as the Nordman Group or the Musée de l'Homme Group, the first so-called resistance group in Paris, because this is a group that, you know, against the wishes of the authorities, is, is going to circulate some information. And Jacques agrees to distribute this newsletter. This is the fall of 1940. Now, at the same time, he has a wife and a family to support. He's working on his doctorate at the Sorbonne. He's also teaching. And in the laboratory, he's, he's still really searching for the problem to sink his teeth into to get his, to get his PhD. And he starts seeing a certain sort of pattern of results, a little, little strange. Now, he's doing some very simple experiments, because in 1940, that's really what biology was about, asking really simple questions about sort of phenomena in life. And he's studying the growth properties of bacteria. And he's doing the really simple-minded experiments about, for example, testing the effect of different nutrients and combining nutrients and seeing how bacteria grow. And when he starts mixing combinations of sugars, he notices something a little weird. So, he notices that when bacteria are grown in certain combinations of sugars, they show this sort of pattern where they grow exponentially and then tail off. But sometimes in certain other combinations of sugars, at least when he, when he plotted out their growth pattern, they, they grew for a while, and, and then well, at least if you connect the dots, then there was sort of a second growth curve. Now, I have to say, and there's a bunch of scientists in the audience that, um, you know, in my lab notebooks, when I have a bunch of dots like this, I would just connect this one to that one <laughs> and say, you know, that was just a bad measurement. But um, this kept coming up in Minot's case. And he was curious, what, what did this little hump in this curve signify? And he, he gave it a name. He called it dioxy, or double growth. Like there were two growth curves joined here. And he, he went to some uh, senior scientists and, and talked to them about it. Said, you know, what, what could be going on? And he decided that this was the phenomenon he was going to study for his doctorate, this little hump in a bacterial growth curve. Now, as it turns out, 25 years later, this is going to result. Understanding what that little hump is is going to result in a Nobel Prize. So let that be a lesson to the younger scientists in the audience. <laughs> um, but it almost didn't happen. And the reason why it almost didn't happen is that just a couple weeks later, the first issue of the newsletter was printed on a primitive hand-cranked um, roneograph. And let me give you a little flavor. They, they called their newsletter Resistance. And let me give you a little sense of the spirit. Resist. This is the cry that comes from the hearts of all of you who suffer from our country's disaster. This is the wish of all of you who want to do your duty, but you feel isolated and disarmed. Resistance is here to speak to your hearts and minds, to show you what to do. And it shared various news items. That are, and this, again, this is to really rally spirits among their close affiliates, like-minded French people who are just feeling the, the incredible distress that the country's in. Well, the little problem is this is the first issue, and uh, small numbers of copies were made, and some young men who had access to a copying machine were uh, given the stencils for this, and they were caught red-handed making copies. And one of them was interrogated, and when he was interrogated, the police found a list of names. And in this list of names, um, well, about 15th down this list of names was the name Jacques Minot. With his address, the Laboratory of Zoology at the Sorbonne, 
Faculty of Sciences, and it explains that he prefers to be contacted between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. And I, 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 can't ex I can't explain that. But see this number here, 20, and you'll see the numbers along all these other names. That was the number of copies that they were to get of this newsletter. So when the authorities got this list, they immediately went out to search either the residences or the places of work of these people. And as soon as they figured out, in the case of Jacques Moneau, that this was his workplace, they got his home address, and they went to his apartment, and they searched him. Jacques was lucky. The newsletters hadn't reached him yet. So he was exonerated. In the detective's report, it just said there's no evidence that Minot was involved in, in this activity. His friend Nordman was not so lucky. When the police searched Nordman's apartment, not only did they find the newsletter and they found stencils, but they found information that Nordman was gathering on German installations in Paris evidence that he was recruiting people to go join de Gaulle's forces in England. Um, so they charged him with espionage. And Nordman was Jewish, so he was prosecuted very aggressively. And Nordman and six others of the Musée de Lum group were among the first resistance executed at Mont Valerien in February 1942. So this, of course, was a horrifying experience for Minot. Um, to lose his friends and his colleagues this way. And it certainly taught him that if he was going to engage in any of this activity in the future, security was going to be very, very important. It was really such a simple lapse that led to such a tragedy. So he hurled himself back into the lab. He studied that little hump for a while and got his doctorate. But while he was working in the lab, the situation in Paris got even worse, and especially more tense for the Minot household. So, for example, there were new ordinances, again, controlling the liberties of the Jewish residents. This regulated shopping hours, uh, where or if anyone could, be for, could uh, eat in a restaurant, for example. Jews were, used, were banned from using public telephones. Then, of course, came the notorious Yellow Star, and then eventually deportations, first of, French, of foreign born Jews right out of Paris. So, Odette was terrified. Um, you know, it, it just didn't know where this, you know, where, where were these measures going to end. But she and Jacques decided that she would not wear the yellow star. And this was a huge infraction written right in the law. She did not want to be identified as, on the street as such. But to not wear the yellow star and to be caught would be probably deportation to a camp. So they decided that the best thing at the time was, to, was for Odette and the children to go south uh, which at the time was not yet occupied by the Germans, to Caen, where Jacques' parents lived, and, and to take the, take the kids out of, uh, out of Paris. Uh, these are the kids. These are the twin boys in the summer, in, around the summer of 1943. And Odette they had one problem, which was there was a, a demarcation line between occupied and unoccupied France, and Jews were not allowed to cross that line. And Odette, whose last name was Bruhl, B-R-U-H-L, it was an obvious and well-known Jewish name, um, she needed to get across the border. So somehow they found somebody who could make up a fake ID where uh, there's Odette and there's some of her information, her, her given name and her married name, and they just changed her last name from the Jewish spelling of, of B-R-U-H-L to the Christian spelling of B-R-U-L-L-E. And she used this um, ID card to get to, the, to get to the south of France. So now with his family safely out of Paris, Jacques has an important decision. This is now the summer of 1943. There are developments occurring in the war. The Allies have landed in North Africa and done pretty well. The sense is, at some point, the Allies are coming back to mainland Europe. And certainly some people in France think that they should be taking more aggressive action against the Germans so that when that day comes, that they can really join in the fight. And so Jacques decides that uh, rather than waiting for that time, he's going to join the most militant resistance group uh, in Paris. It's called the Front Tireur et Partisan, or FTP. This is a, um, a group that started the um, sabotage and assassination uh, actions in, in and around Paris. Um, so, so Jacques joins them, and he learns two things right away. First of all, this is a communist-led group. He was not a communist, but he learned that if, you, if you're not a communist, you weren't going to have much say in what the group did. So despite great reservations about the, the French Communist Party, Jacques joined. The second thing he learned was that the resistance was woefully under-equipped. 
they had almost no arms, no ammunition, no explosives, anything like that. Well, through a family connection, he knew that the Allies had um, set up an operation in neutral Switzerland uh, where there might be the possibility of getting these supplies from, uh, from the Allies for the resistance. So he volunteered to go on a mission to Switzerland. Here's what he's going to have to do. He's going to have to make a trip from uh, Paris uh, to the little town of Annemasse in France, sneak across the border, the heavily guarded border, meet with the Allies in Geneva, sneak back across, and make his way all the way back to Paris. This is a very dangerous mission. The border is heavily guarded. There's all sorts of people trying to sneak into, Sw into neutral Switzerland. Um, but what he really needs to do is he needs to try to convince the Allies that to give arms and ammunition and explosives and ration cards so that resistance members can eat, um, cash for essentially the same reason. And the argument to be made um, to the Allies is to think of the resistance as an, an already landed army essentially behind enemy lines for when that invasion eventually comes. That the, the resistance will be there uh, you know, to, to uh, disrupt German operations and, you know, and, and to join the fight uh, when the fight comes. So that's the argument that, that's going to be made to the Allies. Now the night Jacques is to leave Paris, he actually is, is uh, still conducting choirs even in the middle of the war. Um, and as he leaves, he, he has a briefcase, and he asks one of the students in the choir, a young woman named Jean-Vierve Nouflar, who's 23, year old, 23 years old at this stage, he says, could you please take my briefcase, and if I don't come back in five or six days, could you see to it that my wife is told? And Jean-Vierve was clever enough to understand that Jacques was, was off to do something that she, he couldn't tell her about, and he said, she said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Well, Jacques made it to, uh, to, uh, all the way to Annemasse, made it across the border, went to this gathering. Uh, various other resistance groups across Fran France also sent delegates. And it was a pretty successful mission in terms of starting the process of, of arms drops and things like that to the resistance um, across France. He, uh, not everyone, but Jacques made it safely back. Two, other, two delegates were arrested uh, and were able to sort of almost talk their way out of it. But um, so he made it back safely, and as soon as he made it back to Paris and saw Jean-Vierve to reclaim his briefcase, uh, she said, "I want in." Um, she she understood what Jacques was up to. She had done all sorts of things for the three years of the war um, that were sort of unofficial. She wasn't she wasn't part of any particular group, but she did things. She hid people who were trying to stay away from the Nazis, whether these were resistance members or they were Jews on the run, whatever it might be. She also thought that combat was coming, and she wanted to be part of the effort of, of kicking the Germans out of France. So she asked to, in the, in the slang of the, of the resistance, to entrer dans le bain, to get into the bath, to get into the fight. Jacques tried to dissuade her, because by this time, the pressure on the resistance had really ratcheted up. Um, if you were caught by the Gestapo, by the Germans, torture was a certainty, because you would be tortured to give up the names of other people that you knew. Um, and you just, nobody could predict how they would act under torture. And then after torture, it was probably deportation to a camp, and you know, who knows if anyone would see you again. So he tried to talk her out of it, but she said, no, I, you know, I want to join. And he said, okay. And, and he made her his liaison agent. Now, what's a liaison agent? What jean Viev would do was, every day, pretty much, go out to a set of prearranged rendezvous around Paris. Um, she would meet people in the street, exchange a few words, sometimes a document, and was passing information back and forth, and everyone is using an alias. Okay? And all the location of these meetings change every day because they can't be observed meeting in the same spot day after day. There's just eight, there's Gestapo all over Paris. So she's usually out on her bicycle, makes 10 or 12 of these meetings in a day, comes back, brings the information to Jacques, they huddle at her house, and go over um, the information that's been gathered, decide on the next day's meetings, what other information is going to be trafficked. Uh, Jacques is gathering lots of intelligence from various cells. They're also involved in issuing action orders out to teams in the field. Um, this is going on day after day. It is exhausting, nerve-wracking work because if she's caught, and she has documents with her some days, um, if she's caught, you know, it's the end. Um, so, and lots of people are getting caught. Lots of people they know are getting caught. 
So Jacques is trying to, to sort of juggle a double life. He's still working in the lab by day and doing largely his resistance work at night. His family, as you know, is in, is in the south of France. Um, once his immediate superior in the resistance is captured and tortured, uh, he decides that he better at least uh, stop working at, at the Sorbonne. So he switches. He gets some, uh, an invitation to go work at the Pasteur Institute um, so that, because he figures that Gestapo knows his address. Um, he has another colleague who's arrested and dies in deportation. Um, he's now getting nervous that the authorities know where he lives as well, so he stops going to his apartment. He starts sleeping at a safe house every night. Eventually, he has to give up the lab. Um, he starts wearing a disguise um, so that he's not recognized on the street. Um, so this is incredibly tense. Um, but the whole idea is, is that the invasion must be coming. And in fact, just three days before what turns out to be the Allied invasion, um, there is a meeting of many of the resistance leaders in Paris. Jacques is not at the meeting, and it's a good thing, because the Gestapo raids it and arrests 11 of the leaders of the resistance in Paris. So uh, many, many close calls. But eventually the invasion does come. And because of the arrests of his superiors, uh, this is sort of a perverse way to get promoted in the resistance. Um, when your boss gets arrested, you get promoted. And when that boss gets arrested, you get promoted again. So eventually, uh, Jacques is a very high-ranking member of the, of the resistance with a large amount of, res of nationwide responsibility in the resistance. And let me give you a little taste of what some of that resistance activity was like in the summer of 44 after the invasion. Um, here's, for example, a, a map of, a, of an electric plant with all the various German defense installations uh, marked on the map. Uh, this is a, a plant that's being targeted for sabotage. This is on really light, um, almost tissue paper that's um, being passed on to the action team. You know, the map is being drawn in, by reconnaissance teams and it's being passed on to the action team. Um, here's an order. Um, this is an order, those of you who read French could translate it very quickly. This is an order for a new technique. Uh, it's sharing a new technique with teams in the field of how to sabotage trains when they're in a station to cut the hoses in a particular way that it's really undetectable in the station, but the train will stall out um, before, before it gets too far down the track and therefore block the tracks. And this is an order uh, explaining to please, um, you know, institute this method very quickly and report back on the results. And this is an order actually dictated by Jacques Minot. Now you'll notice it doesn't say at the bottom Jacques Minot because it'd be very dumb to sign an order <laughs> with your name Jacques Minot. Instead it says Malavert. Well, let me let you in on a little aspect of Minot's personality. He had to pick an alias. Well, when he first joined the resistance, thinking, knowing the resistance was so poorly equipped and the German firepower was just massive and it had controlled the country for four years, he thought, well, um, he picks a character from a novel who is impotent. Now, for a French man to pick that as a nom de guerre, I just thought that said a lot about, about Jacques. Anyway, so uh, that's Malavert signing that particular order. But this is, of course, very serious business. And those of you who even don't know French can probably figure out the nature of this order. Um, this is an order, again, signed by Minot in, in the Malavert. And this is an order to execute um, a person who is a uh, collaborator uh, in Paris, uh, gives his uh, whereabouts, gives at least some of it, a little information about his habits. And it and tells it and the order also says to alert essentially those involved in the execution that this man Bruschi is very dangerous and he maybe has been informed ahead of time that his execution has been uh, decided and so this is really important to do this urgently this is in July of 1944 um, I don't know I, I have not met I don't think I don't think I've met a scientist that has ever given an order to execute someone I've met many scientists who've wanted to give that order, uh, at least to peer reviewers. Uh, and I, I might confess that's myself. Um, so uh, again, Jacques is, is still being further promoted. So um, in August of 1944, uh, he is uh, now a commandant um, in the operations wing of, of the resistance with national responsibilities. I like to show this ID card because I think he is in his Willem Dafoe badass looking phase right there. <laughs> Um, with the French tricolors there. Um, so the idea the Allies had after they made progress across Normandy was to work, it was to go around Paris and just to try to chase the Germans out of France the best they could and just leave 
um, Paris as it was, because the prospect of trying to dislodge the Germans out of Paris, um, going house to house, probably having to level the city between bombing and, and combat, and feeding three million civilians. Eisenhower just thought this was a, be a horrible idea. Um, so the whole plan was to go around Paris, but the residents of Paris had a different idea. So in mid to late August of 1944, an insurrection broke out in Paris. Uh, the resistance started to take over some buildings, try to hold them against the Germans. Um, the sabotage and assassination activity picked up. The idea was the resistance wanted to liberate Paris itself. Jacques was really concerned because, again, the, the, the resistance did not have the firepower to deal with the Germans. And holding buildings it seemed to him like a suicidal gesture. So one morning, August 20th, he dictated an order to Jean-Vierre Neuflar. And this is the order. It's on the right. And I'll just give you translation, a little excerpt here on the left. He's, he, he, he's advocating a different tactic than holding buildings. Um, it's to build barricades. And he says, build wherever possible, beginning with large main streets frequented by enemy patrols, barricades that are powerful enough to stop automobiles, trucks, and scout cars with machine guns. These barricades should be built with twists and turns that allow the passage of friendly patrols. He said they should be defended by armed groups that will have the mission of preventing enemy vehicles from penetrating the barricades. And the population should be encouraged by means of posters and loudspeakers mounted on cars to participate in the construction of the barricades. And after he dicta dictates this order, he turns to Neuflar and he says, you know, it's too bad this order is not going to be followed because it just might work. Two days later, this is the scene on the streets of Paris. So, from the loudspeakers mounted on cars, various posters go up, essentially, to the barricades. Citizens go, they're digging up cobblestones out of the streets, packing sandbags, they're wheeling out old vehicles, they're, wheeling, they're bringing out old furniture, and even the kids, you know, there's a little Louis involved. And um, you'll see in a second what these barricades, this is actually footage taken by the French resistance um, in real time. This is a barricade on one of the bridges, and behind those barricades, are members of the resistance, not just with guns, but also with Molotov cocktails. Actually, a special cocktail brewed up by a Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, in France, and um, a very effective cocktail that turns out that you'll see in a second is going to be used on a troop carrier, a German troop carrier. So this battle rages for a few days in Paris, and on August 25th, um, this is the issue of a newspaper in Paris declaring the uh, entry into the capital of French forces followed quickly by Allied forces. I want to just give you a little sense of the relief felt that day. Um, I think this is the happiest day in the history of this great city. Um, and, to, and to get some sense of that, uh, there's an editorial running, and, and this newspaper is, is an important little piece of history. This was an underground newspaper published by one of the resistance groups, a different group called Comba, hence the newspaper Comba. And for the f last four or five days of the insurrection, it was no longer underground, but it was being distributed on the streets. And there were editorials running every day. And I'll give you a little sense. Here's an, here's an editorial running right here on the left. And the editorial said that day, four years ago, a few men rose up amid the ruins and despair and quietly proclaimed that nothing was lost yet. They said that the war must go on. The forces of good could always triumph over the forces of evil, provided the price was paid. They paid that price. Now, the article wasn't signed that day, but the person writing these articles every day, these were articles that exhorted the French citizens to take the fate into their own hands and kick out the invader, to kick out the occupier, was Albert Camus. And from that, about two or three days later, his identity is revealed in subsequent issues of Combat, and he is immediately a national figure. And every day, these editorials in Combat are really starting the process of the renewal of France. And he has this really, by accident, this pulpit of um, urging citizens to, to find their patriotism again and to build a new France better than what they had uh, before the war. More about Albert in a second. For Minot's sake, he was one of these people that had given up a lot of time to the war. Really, the uh, first six years of his kid's life, uh, the first six out of seven years of his marriage. He served another, almost another year. He joined the French army after the liberation of Paris um, and served um, a prominent general. 
But once Germany was defeated, he, of course, wanted out of the military very quickly. And in his own words, he just wanted to draw a curtain over the experience of World War II. Um, he decided that he would go back to the Pasteur Institute to do science. He started to um, interview, for example, first members of his lab staff. And what did he tell them? He told them that he was in search of the secrets of life. So what were the secrets of life circa 1945? Well, one of the central questions was, what are genes made of? And how do genes work to specify the properties of living things? And of all things, when Minot was out in eastern France after the liberation of Paris, serving in the French army, in an American army bookmobile, he came across this article, work by Oswald Avery, that demonstrated that if you took this substance called deoxyribonucleic acid from one particular type of bacterium, it could transfer a trait from that bacterium to another, suggesting that it was the hereditary material. An American Army bookmobile. So Jacques' enthusiasm for genetics and for these questions of heredity were, were really fired up. Um, but he, in, in the last days before he had to quit the lab during the war, and in the first months of being back in the lab, he did some important work in the area of bacterial genetics. And he studied a question, he looked at a question that was very important to him, understanding that little hump. And he did this work with a graduate student um, at the Pasteur Institute named Alice Odero. And this experiment's important enough for the rest of my talk that I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. There was a lot of confusion about what bacteria, you know, what, did, did bacteria even have genes? And um, there was a, a general thought that bacteria seemed to have this ability to grow in almost anything, given enough time. And it wasn't understood whether that was just the ability that bacteria could adapt to any particular food or whether or not um, their abilities were genetically determined. And so Jacques and Alice tried to do an experiment to test this. And what they did was they isolated a strain of bacterium, E. coli, that could not utilize lactose. Again, a little point to the younger members of the audience. Where did they get this bacterium? They got this bacterium from a stool sample from André Lavoff, the head of the lab at the Pasteur. Now, I have met a few scientists that think Nobel Prizes come from their stool samples, okay? This is, again, the first case where it's actually true, okay? So they got a strain that could not utilize lactose, this milk sugar, and they observed when they plated out this bacterium that, and then uh, added a layer of sugar that there were rare, randomly occurring colonies, and this is um, photo uh, microscopy at the, t at, the, at the circa 1946, these little buttons of E. coli were strains that could utilize lactose because when they picked these buttons and streaked them out, they saw that these colonies um, stable, were uh, stable for this trait. So they concluded that these colonies were spontaneous mutations that reversed the original defect in this strain. So there was some reversion of the original defect at a low rate, and, and where those colonies appeared were, were completely at random, and, and keep that in mind. So the, the conclusion was that, in fact, the ability to metabolize lactose was a genetic trait. And uh, they had now, with having mutants that couldn't do it and, and revertants that could do it, they started to get their hands on the genetics of that trait. So very excited, and they flew off to a meeting on Long Island in 1946, where after all the dark years of the war, people who were interested in these problems of heredity met. So that's Cold Spring Harbor. This is Jacques Monod at that meeting, sitting on a bench with Barbara McClintock, a future Nobel laureate. In fact, at this meeting, which maybe had 75 scientists, I think somewhere around eight or nine of them ended up winning Nobel Prizes. So this was a very exciting time. It seemed like some of these deep mysteries of the secrets of life were not only within reach, but perhaps starting to come within uh, scientists' grasp. So when Monod went back to France, he was really excited. And building his group and attacking these, these problems of heredity, and one day, in 1948, he reads a headline in a French newspaper. And uh, I'll give you a little translation. So it says, that, you know, a great scientific event. Heredity is not con controlled by mysterious factors. And he goes on to keep reading about this. And it looks, it sounds like, uh, this, is, this turns out this is one of the communist newspapers, and they're describing uh, some meeting out of the Soviet Union. And is it possible that there's been some great discovery in the Soviet Union in the realm of genetics? And, and, and Jacques reads on, and he becomes horrified. Because that's not what the story is reporting at all. What the reporting is that there's been a 
gathering of the Soviet Academy, um, uh, driven by this person, T.D. Lysenko, who is demanding the reform of Soviet biology based upon uh, some of his work. And Lysenko had, for quite a long time, been making the claim that traits in organisms could, could be produced by just manipulating the environment that they lived in, and that these traits could be inherited. And on this basis, uh, he was arguing that the genetics of the West, based on Mendel and based on Morgan, the very person with whom Mano almost studied in California, that Mendelian and Morganist genetics was erroneous and must be abandoned. Now, the code words erroneous must be abandoned, of course, must be abandoned or else. Lysenko was a favorite of Stalin's. He had won Lenin medals and the Order of the Soviet, you know, Hero of the Soviet Union numerous times. He was really the czar of agriculture in the Soviet Union. And uh, he, he, had, he had Stalin's ear. And so he's really saying, um, you, have to dis you have to essentially abandon this bourgeois genetics of the West and adopt a different model, the Lysenko model. Now, Monod reads on, what is the basis of Lysenko's argument? And here really is the nut of it, and it all pivots on the idea of chance. Lysenko argues that because mutations in organisms are unforeseeable, they lack a material basis, they're miracles. What do I mean by this? If you, if you took a thousand vials of fruit flies and you looked for a white-eyed fly, you don't know which vial it's gonna be in. It's gonna pop up at random. Same thing in a, in a field of plants. You don't know which one's gonna have which sort of variant. So that because they're unforeseeable, they lack a material basis, they're, they're, they're miracles. And he says, you know, in ridding our science of Mendelism and Morganism, we rid it of chance. Sciences such as those as physics and chemistry are rid of chance, something that the physicists and chemists in this room would laugh at. It's for this reason that they've become exact sciences. So of all things, Lysenko is arguing that the role of chance in biology is why 50 years of genetics has to be purged. So what's Minot going to do? And I know some people must be thinking, what am I doing? I'm, you know, <laughs> it's Friday night. It's, oh my God, it's 9 o'clock. This guy's talking about some guy in 1948. Why is this important? This is important because pretty much you're looking at the end of Soviet biology. Okay, so this is a pivotal point for France. This is a pivotal point for the Soviet Union. It's a pivotal point in the history of biology. What's Minot going to do? Is he going to write a little complaint to a scientific journal? No. He goes public on the front page of, of all newspapers, Comba. Here's his article. Don't, that's not Minot. His, the article's down here. Okay. And let me just give you a little taste of the tone of Minot's comments. Lysenko's victory has no scientific basis whatsoever. Today, Lysenko's truth is the official truth guaranteed by the state. His opponents who defend science are practically accused of treason. All of this is senseless, monstrous, unbelievable, a sign of the mortal decay into which socialist thought has fallen in the Soviet Union. Why does this matter? Because at this time in France, the communists are very powerful. They're very popular politically because of their role during the war. Labor unions are very powerful. Minot's, Minot's own brother-in-law is communist. Minot's superior in the resistance and his department head is communist and had written in support of Lysenko in the previous day's newspaper. Okay? So there's very high stakes here for biologists have to decide if you're a communist biologist in France, do you toe the party line, which is required, or do you follow where the empirical work is going? And this is what Minot so, of course, this is going to cause a lot of rifts, a lot of echoes. This is the only op-ed, essentially, that Minot, to my knowledge, wrote. And it's going to bring three really important people into his life. The first of which is Albert Camus. Because at, at this very time, Camus is having the same thoughts about the Soviet Union. Now, Camus is part of the French left. But what he sees in Stalin is exactly the same traits they saw in Hitler. Dogmatism, prisons, execution of opponents, the same sort of thing. He's working on a book that's going to detail those ideas. The book is known as, in French as L'homme révolté, or the rebel in English. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little something up on the right. Uh, I was very happy. So, so, Minot and Camus were introduced at a meeting of um, human rights groups. They hit it off. 
they ended up talking a lot about their understanding of what was going on in the Soviet Union. And I found that Minot had a 66-page unpublished manuscript on Lysenko, which was essentially a, uh, an autopsy of, of Lysenko. And I find fragments of it right in Camus' book, such as this. For Marxism to remain infallible, and this is a, this is a damning critique of the whole Stalin system, uh, in, in this Stalinist system, in this book, uh, Camus labels Marxism a religious prophecy, which is not going to endear him to the French left. Um, it's been therefore necessary to deny all biological discoveries made since Darwin. All discoveries since have consisted in introducing the idea of chance into biology. I guarantee you that Albert Camus did not come up with this idea on his own. Okay. So the fingerprints of Minot are, on, are in uh, one of Camus' most important books. This book, when it's published in 1951, is going to rupture instantly Camus' relationships with the French left, most famously the philosopher-writer Jean-Paul Sartre. They're never going to speak again after the publication of this book. Camus is advocating an anti-communist, anti-Stalin stance. A good part of the French left is towing the line uh, with, with communism. And this is a public, very public break, um, a very painful break to Camus. He was really, really shattered by what he felt was the disloyalty of his friends in the French left, who really abandoned him. Um, but at the very same time, he had new friends like Minot. And uh, you can ask me more about it later, but really, Minot and Camus are going to be very like-minded. And the, one of the real tests is going to, well, I'll give you a little sense of that. Um, this is actually from the inside of Jacques' personal copy of L'Ombre Volte, a little note from Albert Camus to Jacques Minot. Um, this answer to a few of our questions with our underlined fraternally Albert Camus. They're going to be good friends for the rest of Camus' life. And their mutual uh, contempt for the Stalin, Stalinist communist situation is really going to be vindicated five years later, most especially with the uh, crushing of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. So Hungarians almost break the, the Soviet yoke, but uh, the Kremlin reverses and crushes this uh, rebellion in, in 1956, a very violent um, period. And at this time, Camus goes public, essentially saying it's, you know, same as the old boss. Khrushchev is the same as the old boss. Um, and uh, Camus goes very public, speaking out for artists and uh, that are being, and writers that are being imprisoned, some of them being executed in Hungary, uh, Minot gets into another business as regard to Hungary. He meets, in 1958, this woman, Agnes Ullmann. Agnes comes for a very short visit to Paris from Hungary. Agnes was deeply involved in the, in the uh, failed Hungarian Revolution. She was running guns. She was close to many of the people who were principally involved in the, in the revolutionary movement. Uh, her husband had been arrested. They were under constant police surveillance. She did get, she was a biochemist. She is a biochemist. Um, she got permission to travel outside the country to a meeting, and she approached Minot in Paris. And when Minot learned of her plight, Minot simply asked her, do it, do you, would you and your husband come out if, if given the chance? Get out of Hungary. And she said, yes. And he said, well, then I'll help you. So what most floored me about what I learned about Jacques Minot was that in 1958, which turns out to be the most creatively intense period in his life, where over the next two years he's going to do the work that's going to earn him the Nobel Prize, he works throughout that time using a lot of techniques he learned in the resistance to smuggle Agnes Ullman and her husband out of Hungary. That involves, for example, the exchanging of messages once Agnes is back in Hungary, written in invisible, I am not making this up, written in invisible ink on the inside of record jackets. This is a, a Bella Bartok album. Well, Agnes is an expert in starch biochemistry. And she teaches Minot that if you write with starch and you can develop it with iodine, you can see a message. So on the inside of this jacket, she has written a message to Minot. And all he knows he has to do is, is, to, is to treat it with iodine and to reveal the message. The cover letter with this album it looks totally harmless. She's visited him in Paris and said, well, I, you know, I, I think you would like this new Bella Bartok album. <laughs> and it's because it has information on how, to, how they're going to get smuggled out of Hungary. Um, so this goes on for about two years. At this very same time, and because, again, of that original, the only reason, i sorry, I forgot to mention this. The only reason that Agnes Ullman knew who Jacques Minot was 
was that a friend of hers in the Hungarian Revolution movement showed her a copy of that Komba article, which, you know, the indictment of the Soviet system. So she knew that's the one Western scientist name she knew. So she went to find Minot. Third person brought into Minot's life, because Minot became a public figure over this whole Lysenko episode, uh, another person named Francois Jacob, who uh, was going to be a physician. Uh, he was a medical student when the war broke out. Uh, he raced for the coast, made it to England, served with de Gaulle for four years as a medic, um, but he was nearly killed in Normandy. And he was so badly wounded, he could not uh, become a doctor, so he decided to enter scientific research. And in a long, meandering course, he just happened to find himself on the same floor as Jacques Minot at the Pasteur Institute. And after several years of working on that floor, they teamed up to crack the central problem that Minot was after, which was understanding, again, that little hump of how bacteria deal with different sugars. And this, by 20 years later, this was a problem known as enzyme induction. This is the one scientific graph I think I'm going to show you. Here's the phenomenon. What happens in the presence of particular sugars, or when a sugar is added to a culture of bacteria, is that the bacteria can respond by making an enzyme that breaks down that sugar. So the enzyme is made or induced only in the presence of, in this case, lactose, this milk sugar, and that lactose is, called, is described as an inducer. And the fundamental question when you think about how simple bacteria is, how do bacteria know when to make an enzyme and when not to? So they make, they make the enzyme in the presence of the sugar, but if you remove that sugar, if you remove that inducer, they no longer make the enzyme. How does that work? And what Jacob and Minot worked out, primarily from a genetic approach, was the idea of a genetic switch. That the genes for metabolizing lactose are turned on in the presence of the sugar, and they're kept off when it's absent. This was a flurry of incredibly creative research over the period of 1958 to 1960. Again, absolutely parallel thing going on. Same day that Minot was working on some of the classic papers in the early uh, years of molecular biology, he's working on getting Agnes Ullman out of Hungary. And there's four failed attempts. For this work on the genetic switch, in 1965, Minot, Jacob, and Andre Lavoff, who did contribute more than just that stool sample, um, <laughs> are awarded the Nobel Prize. And this is a, a, a huge day in France. It's the first scientific Nobels in France in a long time. And of course, it's a clean sweep, three Frenchmen. And when the press learns the backstory of these folks, they've got gold. Minot, a hero of the resistance. Jacob served with de Gaulle overseas. Lavoff, uh, a painter, a distinguished member, a longtime distinguished member of the pa Pasteur Institute. Um, Jacob, a family man. Minot, a family man. Minot, a sailor, a musician, a pretty handsome guy. Even Jacob thought that Minot looked like a Roman emperor. Um, so uh, they, were, they were hot copy. But of the three of them, the one person who was sort of most disposed, most prepared to take advantage of this limelight was Jacques Minot. So in the first week after he won the Nobel Prize, he gave a far-ranging interview to really sort of the equivalent of, at the time, you know, Time Magazine or whatever in, in, in France. Um, and so he became a real go-to person um, uh, for the press in France on all sorts of issues, especially about science and about education. And really, in the absence, so 1960, years earlier, his friend Albert Camus was killed in a car accident. And I would suggest that a lot of Minot's life after the, after the Nobel, he really sort of assumed the mantle that I think Camus would have held if, if Camus was still alive. So that, for example, when um, Martin Luther King came to Paris in 1966 on a fundraising mission, it was Jacques Minot who introduced King to a star-studded audience of 5,000 people in Paris. Uh, and here you can see he's obviously shaking hands of Coretta Scott King, but that is Yves Montand. There's Harry Belafonte. One of these two is Simon Signore, and I forget which one. Maybe you guys know. Somebody, somebody's pointing to the left. Somebody's pointing on the left. Thank you very much. I forget my own figure legends. Okay, um, that one. Um, so, um, and two years later, uh, right after Dr. King's assassination, it was Minot who gave the public eulogy in Paris. And in that eulogy revealed that, in fact, King had predicted he would be assassinated um, when he visited Paris. I mean, not in Paris, but when he first met Minot in Paris. Right after Dr. King's assassination, in fact, in May 1968, uh, 
there was great disorder in France, as there was even over here. Um, it began with student protests and student riots in the Latin Quarter in, Fran in Paris, and it spread across the country. And uh, Manot wound up being the go-between uh, between the students, particularly at the Sorbonne, and the government. Um, here is a, a photo of Manot escorting a wounded student out of the Latin Quarter. Uh, he'd actually been there overnight. Somehow he still emerged looking pretty well pressed in his uh, shirt and tie after an all-nighter um, of, of riots and tear gas. Um, but he was in the papers every day during this time. The, this led to national strikes. It almost took down the de Gaulle government. Uh, but again, Minot was being quoted in the paper every day. Um, so here was this person, you know, very public figure, war hero, Nobel laureate. And some of his friends said to him, because it looked like the de Gaulle government was going to topple, maybe you should run for president. Can you imagine that? A scientist as president. You know, look at who we got for governors around the country. Oh, don't get me started. Okay. Um, so Manel thought about it, but he decided, um, no, he wasn't going to run for president, but there were some things that were worth campaigning for. In particular, he wanted to campaign for a greater role of science in the culture. He felt that these discoveries from molecular biology were profound and had not really penetrated the broader culture, that the philosophers and the theologians, let alone the layperson in the street, um, didn't understand their impact. And so that uh, was one inspiration for writing the book, uh, Chance and Necessity. Now, Chance and Necessity, uh, against all Minot's expectations and certainly all his friends, becomes a bestseller in France. It is no a number two bestseller behind Love Story. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding, you, but you know, let's keep our priorities straight, all right? Uh, also, uh, a bestseller in Germany, bestseller in other places. Not a bestseller in the United States. What do you think? Well, maybe it was quotes like this. Chance alone is at the source of every innovation, of all creation in the biosphere. This central concept of modern biology is no longer one among other possible hypotheses. It's the only one that squares with observed and tested fact. And nothing warrants the hope that on this score, our position is likely ever to be revised. There is no scientific concept in any of the sciences more destructive of anthropocentrism than this one. Um, this uh, struck a few chords, hit a few nerves, you can imagine. Uh, the book was widely reviewed in the American press, two reviews, interviews in the New York Times, etc. Of course, theologians, philosophers, all sorts of people got into the game. But Minot felt very strongly from what had been learned from molecular biology, and it was particularly the nature of random mutation, understanding the genetic code, understanding the structure of DNA, understanding that changes in that DNA were necessary for the generation of all diversity on the planet, and that that was fundamentally a random, unguided process, um, that that had profound philosophical implications. Now, of course, we know more about this random process than Minot could have possibly known in 1970 when he wrote these words. We can study how mutations arise in DNA with more power um, than I think Minot could have possibly imagined. But I think of all the discoveries made after Minot's time, perhaps the most powerful with respect to the role of chance in the course of life on Earth, was reported in 1980, where um, Louis and Walter Alvarez and their colleagues proposed, based on novel evidence, that 66 million years ago, an asteroid had struck the Earth and triggered a mass extinction. Energy we now know, many be years later, about that an asteroid about six miles wide, traveling about 50,000 miles an hour, struck the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and that it uh, ejected massive amounts of debris that, circ that circulated around the globe that had profound ecological effects on the planet, triggering a mass extinction that killed everything on land that was greater than 25 kilograms in, in body weight. And that, of course, um, this changed the course of life on the planet. Uh, that was the end of the era of the reptiles. Um, but um, what was very bad you know, for the dinosaurs turned out to be very good for the mammals, which were largely not too uh, significant or prevalent at the time. Um, but mammals flourished after this asteroid impact in the subsequent millions of years. And among those mammals included primate ancestors. And among those primate ancestors, of course, are, are our ancestors. So this, the biggest strike we know of in the last half billion years, you know, the asteroid could have easily missed. And the course of life on Earth would be different. And you can easily say, if were it not for the asteroid, there'd be no us. So 
the role of, the, of chance, the powerful role of chance in the course of life on Earth is well established from the molecular to the planetary scale. So how do we deal now with that information? Well, Manel had a lot of things to say with this, but I'm going to close tonight with, um, with how he answered that question from a 13-year-old boy. Um, in the early 1970s, Mano had taken the directorship of the Pasteur Institute. Um, he had some tragedy in his life. Odette died of cancer. Mano himself contracted viral hepatitis, and then some, for of, some form of aplastic anemia. He was required uh, frequent transfusions, um, so that by early 1976, he was, he was really struggling. But despite his duties and despite his health, when he got this letter from Bruno, a young boy from Grenoble, um, he decided to answer it. So Bruno, in January 1976, wrote Mano and said, I'm a 13-year-old boy who is very interested in research. I know that you're one of the greatest researchers in the world. Our professor of science told us so. <laughs> Excuse me for bothering you, but I would like to know what maxim guides your life. Perhaps I could apply that when I grow up. Goodbye, Monsieur Mano, and Happy New Year 1976, Bruno. So Mano answers, My dear Bruno, all I can tell you are the qualities that appear most important to me. If one were to pose this question to me, I would reply without a doubt that they are courage, as much moral as physical, as well as the love of truth, or rather the hatred of lies. Thank you for the New Year's wishes. Happy New Year and good wishes to you. And four months later, Jacques Bonneau passes away. So that's really the story I came to tell you tonight. Um, but I couldn't have told you the story without the help of a lot of people. So before I wrap up, I want to tell you about some of those people and thank them. I told you about this young music student, jean Vieve Nouflar, who was Manot's assistant through the in the resistance. I'm happy to tell you that jean Vieve Nouflar is 94 years old and alive and well and living in the very same home in Paris out of which she and Manot conducted, conducted their resistance operations. I just saw her again last November and enjoyed a very long lunch with her. jean Vieve, uh, at the end of the war, because she couldn't really, she really shouldn't have saved the, doc the documents I showed you were largely from her. Um, she really shouldn't have been saving them, but she did save some of them and, and, and turn them all over to me. But also, jean Vieve at the end of the war in 1945, because she had all this information from the resistance that she had not written down, she wrote a memoir that she never published, but that she handed to me in 2010, full of stories of her exploits in the resistance. I couldn't have told you a fraction of what I told you tonight without that generosity from this extraordinary person. Um, Agnes Ullman, I left you hanging. So there's Agnes in Paris in 1958, very briefly. Here's Agnes today. In 1960, the summer of 1960, she and her husband were smuggled successfully out of Hungary in an operation that Minot personally orchestrated. And um, she is still at the Pasteur Institute today, working more than 50 years later. Uh, a magnificent woman. She was born in Transylvania, educated in Romania, moved to Hungary, and now lives in France. She speaks a unique language known as Agnes. Um, and she's treated me to what she calls picnics in her apartment, which require, I think, 10 times the liver that I actually have, um, as, as well as the largest loaves of bread and wheels of cheese that you know, no human could possibly eat. But um, she's really an incredible person. And I wouldn't be able to tell you much about Odette and Jacques if it were not for the discoveries, the, the happy discoveries, um, that Olivier Minot, um, I don't know which one he is because they're twins in this picture, but I know he's this one over here with me in Paris. Um, Olivier, letters between his parents that no one knew about, all sorts of family uh, documents that uh, Olivier spent a lot of extra energy um, digging up and allowed me to tell you the story. So I thank them and I thank you for your attention. I think we have time for a few questions. Sure, I'll give it a whirl if you're brave enough. Okay, we have a Still couple Friday. of microphone runners. Um, would you raise your hand if you want to ask a question? Don't be shy, keep your hand up so they can see you. They'll bring you a microphone. And then when you get the microphone and it's your turn, stand up, tell us your name, and whether you're a member of the society or you're not, there's no penalty for not being a member. We'll just hound you to become a member. <laughs> uh, we have a question up here, Bob Hershey. If you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, 
Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Uh, what were the main experiments that led him to this discovery that got him the Nobel? Well, there was a series of experiments, and it's a really, um, it's, it's really exciting to, to even kind of go back through them. But what I think there was a, there was a tremendous chemistry between Jacob and Minot. And I would say Minot was this super logician. Minot had this mind was sort of like, if A was true, then B would be true, or it, if, it, then either B or C would be true, but if B was true, then if this experiment was done this way, that would mean, you know, he was just great at working out the potential outcomes of experiments and what they would mean. Jacob, on the other hand, I think almost had the greater imagination in terms of imagining what life could look like at sort of the invisible level, picturing sort of the machinery inside the cell. And so that interplay led them to a series of experiments that was sort of the march of logic that, that sort of revealed piece by piece the machinery that determined whether or not a gene was turned on or turned off. And the experiments that were done were all, um, almost all genetical, meaning that they were um, experiments of mixing various genetic backgrounds of bacteria or mixing or using, for example, viruses to transport genetic material into bacteria. And then from the behavior of the resulting bacteria interpreting what was going on. So they couldn't see any of these molecular details. There was no, you know, detailed readout of any of this. They had to interpret from the behavior of the bacteria what that meant for the logic of the machine. And I think that's why I just admire this body of work as, you know, I, I think it's a true piece of genius. That it's that combination of imagination, experimental creativity, and it unfolds in a really short period of time. Now some of the papers are in French before they before you hear it, see the ideas in English. But if you're curious, this 1958 to 1960 period, about every three months, one idea pops. And almost usually by the discussion part of the paper, the next idea is anticipated, even if they don't have any data. Yes, publishing was different then than it is today. And then, um, and then you see that idea sort of in its experimental evidence in the next paper. And so about every three months, one of the big ideas, and just for those of you in the world of molecular biology, this is going to be repressors, operators, operons, messenger RNA. This all unfolds in a two-year period. And we work, we, for those of you who are not biologists, those are uh, you know, pillars in sort of the conceptual foundation of, of molecular biology, words we still use today. In fact, a lot of this material was really some of the, the raw material for the birth of genetic engineering. Yes, these were genetic tools that were used a decade later to manipulate DNA for pharmaceutical purposes and things like that. So it was, it was quite a foundation that they laid in a pretty short period of time. Here come some more hands. I'll let you guys move the mics. And I'm Rob Klein, I'm a member. I uh, wanted to ask you, would you expand upon the term chance? When I think of chaos theory, I think of chance and misnomers and misunderstanding about chance. I think chance, the mechanism, what, what Minot is really thinking about, and I, of course, I showed you uh, in sort of an astronomical thought about chance, but it, at the genetic level, the idea that you have this simple four base language of DNA, and that at a low frequency, largely at random, in DNA, when it's copied, substitutions are made. And the, where those occur, is a matter of chance. Now, the properties of the resulting organism, okay, and that competitive process of natural selection, you know, that's determined by the environment, and that, that matters. That's obviously the second factor. But really, the idea that the generating mechanism here, of all, at its root, of all biological diversity, is one fundamentally rooted in chance. That's, what I, that's, that's Minot's core idea. And of course, he he then uses that to explore its theological and philosophical implications. Um, when I talk about chance in an astronomical way, I guess I'm really just saying the um, very, since it's the largest impact in the last half billion years, I think it could have easily missed. Um, it could have hit a different place on the Earth with perhaps a different outcome. Um, that looks like a, uh, you know, a, a rare astronomical event that changed the course of life on Earth. Um, so I think it's, a, it's a, the, the great paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson said, you know, if, 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 if there is a plan, it's, it's, it's a real lousy one, you know, with, given all the extinctions. 
So um, does that help you in terms of think about uh, chance? It's a probabilistic sense of chance. OK? Yeah. Well, let's, let's make sure you, the microphones come around. I think there was another. There's one. Sorry, you're one more coming. Yeah. Um, yeah, George Bailey, not a member presently. But while this is a great discussion here about the ramifications of chance and in scientific discovery, I want to more explore the interaction between the rational, very rational, logical mind of one, one person here interacting with perhaps a more creative um, mind and that interaction itself is what might have led to both the formulation of what problem to solve and how to solve that problem how to solve that problem was sort of an interaction effect yes that each individual separately wouldn't have come to that at least that's what i would say but your your views are important but how did that interaction actually work can you characterize the interaction between the two individuals Jacoba Minot, yeah. in this case, yeah. The, well, the, you, you want the, inter, the what what dimension of that interaction? You want you want, you want the, the daily picture of, of uh, coffee and gesticulation going on in front of a green blackboard for four hours a day. That was that's that's part of the way it happened. But well, why did it work? Why did it work? Um, I'll, I'll take a few ingredients. I think the I think the sense of purpose for people coming out of World War II was extremely, it was very keen in Minot, it was very keen in Jacob. The excitement of being able to explore these secrets of life, of, of peering in when no, you know, nobody had peered in, right? I mean, 1953 is, is the double helix, and actually one of the first people that Watson took the, the first model of DNA to was Minot, because he, he had met Minot and he thought, well, this guy will at least appreciate it, and this is before it's published and, and talks about it. So to be in that environment where these first glimpses into these deep secrets are, are around. I think that that, um, the, at, the intellectual atmosphere, the, you know, the sense of adventure, the, um, you know, I just think that things were, to find you know, some cliche, things were sort of firing on all cylinders. And the commitment, um, it, it just created an incredibly fertile period for devising experiments that had no precedent. Right? It's not like there's a long recipe, you know, not like there was a long recipe list of this is how you do things. Both Minot and Jacob had figured out how to do things that nobody had done before. Um, so uh, I, I think that combination, and then they were working off each other because I think they found in each other a compliment. Minot's sort of super lo lo logical, deductive methods and thinking and uh, Jacob's kind of fearless imagination of, you know, could it be like this? And sometimes you'd get a reaction from Minot of, oh, that's so simplistic, it can't be like that. And then later Minot would go, it's so simplistic, it's got to be right. Um, so they had that sort of interaction. And, uh, you know, there, we could probably look, you know, through science for some pairings like that. Uh, but it was just really supercharged for, you know, for a period of time. It was technical creativity. It was conceptual creativity. It was such an intense time. And I think that there was a small group, when I say a founder of molecular biology, there was a small group of maybe 20, 25 people that were seeing each other on a regular basis. And there was also just sort of a, a certain amount of fertilization going on. Even if people were asking the wrong questions, it was probably provoking somebody to do the right experiment. And, um, you know, there, there are just phases like this, I think, in scientific history where uh, things just happen a lot faster um, than at other times. And this, this is one of them. You're asking about the interaction between, I hope that's all I can give you the insight. And, and I, I, the reason why I talk about, you know, the original quote about, you know, ge genius is talent set on fire by courage. I just find that element that having been through hell, their sense of purpose, you know, Mino I mean, Jacob had lost his livelihood. He spent five years struggling after the war, even finding any kind of job. So to, f to get this opportunity and to be so intellectually engaged and for it to be so exciting, I mean, he was just all in. And Minot was all in. And I, I think that maybe, you know, experiencing the worst the world had to offer and being deprived of almost everything, again, just gave an incredible sense of purpose. And it, as it did to Camus. Camus wrote like a fiend. You know, he's working on two plays and a novel and, and editorials and four girlfriends all at once. Okay? So, yeah, true story. Well, maybe I won't read. Maybe you'll read the book. I, 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 won't, I won't tell you any more about Camus. Sorry. 
Spoiler. This is uh, such a, fa oh, Paul Gaillet, a non-member. This is such a fascinating and interesting story. I wondered if you have considered or anyone has approached you about making a, a TV show out of it, a movie or a TV show on one of the science series. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, so let's take a vote. Should it be, should it be on film? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think so. I, I, so let me ask you, let me answer you very honestly. So I, I have a lot of um, activity in film these days and um, you know, learning my way through that world. This is one of the stories I'd like to see in some form and there's really two different. There's, there's, there's documentary and there's drama. Um, so I hope I'll get a chance to some, you know, collaborate with the right people someday to see this story told because I think whether it's the, you know, World War II obviously is a, is a font of millions of stories. Um, so I don't, you know, there's, there's that particular drama, but there's also this incredible engagement. I barely gave you a taste of the Camus Minot relationship and the ideas that, that um, swirled about them. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of curious that if I gave this material to 10 different writers, you know, screenwriters, what would they come up with? You know, which, which, which slice of the story would they want to do? So, um, four yeah, the four girlfriends part, yeah. Yeah, that's HBO. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, and uh, God, God knows what the History Channel would do. Sorry, that's a, that's a cheap shot. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to see it sometime because I think it's, you know, it's, a way, it's, it's easier to share a story in those, in those kinds of media. So thank you for that. I, I, I don't have direct control. I, I'm just basically telling you that I hope sometime in the next five or six years maybe we'll see it. Yep. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marie Burton. I'm, I'm not currently a member. Um, uh, You've kind of answered one of my questions. Why is it this is the first time we are hearing about this guy? Uh, I mean, in addition to everything else, he looks like a Greek god. I mean, this is, guy was made to have a, a film or something dramatic made about him. My actual question, though, was uh, had had uh, to do with you. Um, you refer to Watson, and um, I'm wondering how much uh, actually. Um, I, I know you've sort of uh, talked around this. Uh, the you know Watson and and Crick's uh, uh, discovery of of the structure, how much that uh, influenced um, his. You wouldn't be necessary to know the structure to also uh, project uh, the functionality of the this idea of activation and then and reversibility of, of activation of, of gene sequences and. Yeah. Um, so I I think. Um, it, it helped to know the structure of DNA because you could start to picture in your mind what was going on around a gene that meant it was on or off. So if that was still unsolved, you'd sort of be groping around in this soup of not knowing what in the cell was important, it, you know, what was the structure of DNA or RNA and, and things like that. So it, it really helped. But a lot, I think a lot of their achievement was logical and sort of, you know, it was imaginative and it was a good thing that the DNA structure was was there for them to be, you know, pondering as they imagined what a gene looked like inside a cell. Um, but, but it wasn't, you know, the details didn't matter so much, I think, to them at, at the time. In fact, some of the things they first came up with really weren't, that ac weren't precisely accurate either. They got, they got the logic right, they didn't get some of the biochemical details right, Jacob and Minot. Those, the real clarification of what was going on was probably took till about 1966 and invo started to involve the work of, of other people. Um, but being in that environment of people who are asking the right questions and getting new ideas and new insights all the time, I think that was really important that the British, that their labs were full of, of American and European and British scientists. The British, the leading British minds were over in France all the time. The French minds were over in Britain all the time. There was just a lot of, of getting together of these um, folks who, who worked out some really fundamental things in a short period of time. I think we had a question over here. Yeah, this. I think it's right. We're going to take two more questions. Two more. Here we go. The microphones can. And I'll try to make the answer shorter. Questions. Because uh, Wisconsin plays in about. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Jim McCormick, and I'm not a member yet. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about this bookmobile. 
And then also <laughs> maybe the combination of chance and necessity that caused you to uh, dig into this story and learn so much about it. All right, those are, those are two interesting. So Bookmobile, all I can say is Mano mentioned it like twice, including once in his Nobel address, that he said, you know, I came across this paper in, in, uh, in, the, in an American book, Bookmobile. Um, and I guess, you know, at the time, you know, people just didn't do interviews, you know, and, and the, you know, I'd have loved to be able to answer that for you, but I chased every trail there was, right? Where did he find it? What was he exactly doing? Um, how did I get into this one? Boy, talk about chance. Ready for this? Oh, uh, give me a second. Uh, okay, I, I was familiar with Jacobo Minot's work because I myself have worked on the regulation of genes in animal development and evolution. I always admired the body work. It's incredibly elegant. I was exposed to it as an undergraduate. I just thought, oh my God, this is just so crisp. The, the writing in their papers is so phenomenal. So I was a big admirer. Now, here's the huge chance part. Uh, I had taken advanced placement French as a high schooler. And the college I went to had the rule that to get the credit for AP, you had to take the next course up. Oh, I didn't want to take any more French. Are you kidding me? Right? So I take this course, and the professor's phenomenal. And I have all these other classes, you know, physics, calc, biology, et cetera. And the French was like a breath of fresh air during the day, right? I'm reading, I'm reading Camus, right? And I, all right, so I decide to take another French class and another French class. And I, now pretty soon, I'm pretty darn close to a double major. I've taken like seven classes with this prof. And, uh, and then I'm reading, you know, oh, incredibly dense works that didn't seem fair. But um, <laughs> it, was just, it was just a nice relief from all the science and math. And... Um, you know, it was just a source of enjoyment. I was, and I think a really important thing was I was just writing in French a lot. And I, that had some effect, that, some intangible effect, I think, writing at length in a foreign language. And, um, and then it turns out, for reasons that my, my brother's here in the front row, uh, a journalist here in Washington, I don't know how he and I, or actually most of our family, grew up as World War II buffs, right? It was kind of all around us. It may have something, well, I won't get into too many family stories. Yeah. But uh, Jim and I, my brother Jim right here, in the, er, in the uh, early 80s did a, a tour through lots of European battlefields, just he and I for like three weeks in a car. And so I'd always been interested in this stuff. And so, okay, ready? 30 years, uh, well, I shouldn't reveal that, but yes, it's been, it was 30 years past. And, um, and language skills had gone to pot. But... You know, I had read that, that Minot and Camus were friends, and I thought, God, is there something to that? Um, and it was sort of bothering me that I wanted to look into Minot's life, but I realized that if I don't start, if I don't do something soon, the people who could tell me aren't going to be around. Um, so I decided that if I could find any new substantive information about Camus and Minot's relationship, that maybe there'd be a story. And I found some letters that revealed a very warm rapport between them. And then I met Agnes Ullman, and she had never told the story of being smuggled out of Hungary by Minot, ever. And she resisted telling me for months, saying it still upset her. She was still thinking about what happened and going across the border, where if she was caught, she was probably facing 20 years in prison, still made her you know, essentially break out in a cold sweat 50 years later. But when I learned that that's what Minot was doing at the same time he was doing these experiments with Jacob, I was over the edge. Now, I had some other responsibilities in life, so I just ignored them and uh, <laughs> ran with the story. So it's World War II, accidental French, and uh, fell in love with uh, gene regulation at an early stage as a, as a biologist. And then opportunity. I've been a really lucky guy in my profession to be able to find the time and get the opportunity to, yes, I had to go to Paris repeatedly <laughs> to research this. I had to stay on the left bank and eat their lousy food <laughs> and meet these people. And uh, somehow a story then came out of that. Thank you for asking. We got one more uh, question. Hi. Yeah, my name is Elisa Wynn. I'm the uh, guest of a member. Uh, my son, the sociologist, has his favorite quote as a pastor quote about chance favors the prepared mind and um, 
You know, it really strikes me that the kind of life that actually succeeded in our world, because we don't know what didn't succeed, um, the, having read your book after hearing you uh, at the Carnegie Institute, um, that we have this tremendous reservoir in our genetic code, our entire uh, all life on Earth, that the chance can activate, that there's, there's this reservoir of stuff in our genetic code that when chance hits, there's something there. We're not so uh, uh, soli yeah, yeah, yeah. solitary in our, uh, in our thing. And, you know, do you think perhaps just speculating about uh, life that might have uh, taken hold and not succeeded, um, that that might be why we're here and um, because of pastor's quote. <laughs> yeah, so, so do you want, you want a biological interpretation of that? Of life Whatever. To, well, I'll, okay, I'll give you one, which is, um, uh, I'm just going to run with that, okay? This may not be exactly what you're asking, but uh, we can talk about this afterwards. But, you know, it's very interesting to contemplate what life forms have made it on Earth and, and, and which didn't, right? And, or there's a whole group of organisms around uh, at the time, before the time of what's known as the Cambrian Explosion. You may have heard about the Cambrian Explosion that a little younger than 540 million years ago, lots of the groups of animals that we're familiar with today, they're, they're sort of first signs in the fossil record. And they, come, they come on pretty rapidly, geologically speaking, but there's stuff that existed before that, that to this day we don't know how to interpret them. Macroscopic forms, they're, they're all over Australia, but they're in other places in, in, in the world as well. And, um, you know, some people have proposed that that was sort of one of the first experiments in larger life, multicellular life, and <laughs> out it went. And that boundary, when we talk about the pre-Cambrian and the Cambrian, every time in geology we talk about one time period, another time period, there's reasons why we subdivide those time periods. They really mark usually a changeover in the type of life forms that are there. And what you see in the pre-Cambrian, what you see in the Cambrian is just totally different, it, largely entirely different stuff. And um, so why did those life forms, the life forms we're more familiar with, you know, make it or not? These are some of the still profound mysteries of the, of the story of, of life on Earth. And if you want to make it a little more personal, you know, there have been a lot of hominids in the last five million years. And, you know, it was only 60, 70,000 years or so ago that some of them made it out of Africa and crossed into the Middle East. And, you know, how different would the world be if those wanderers didn't, didn't do that, right? So there's a, there's a combination when you think about chance. There's not just the genetic chance, but there's really the sort of the, the contingency of history. You know, things, things that, it, that happened, also like the asteroid, that had it not happened, life would look entirely different. So if Homo sapiens, this, this weird primate, doesn't leave Africa, you know, we're not having this conversation. Um, but the asteroid doesn't hit, we're not having this conversation. So uh, those, are, those are things I just like to, to chew over, you know, on my way to Sunday school. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, okay, I didn't disappear. <laughs> you coached me. So in appreciation for giving this wonderful lecture, I'm going to present you with this uh, framed copy of the announcement of your talk signed by members of the General Committee on behalf of all PSW members and on behalf of everybody who attended this talk. Thank you very Thanks much. Very Thanks, much. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everybody.